I've been training my whole life. What is the point if I'm not allowed to you face an actual why, risk? Paul. You're the future of House Atreides. And grandfather fought bulls for sport. Look where that got him. For hundreds of years, we've traded blood for blood. But no more. Tonight, the house of Atreides falls. Here I am. Here I am. <sighs> So, it's done. It's done. Once upon a time, in the grand space opera of Dune, there was a man named Duke Leto Atreides I. Born in the year 10,140 AG, he was famously known as the Red Duke, and affectionately called Leto the Just. He wasn't just any noble, but the second to last Duke of the mighty House Atreides, the father of Emperor Paul Atreides and Regent Alia Atreides with his Bene Gesserit concubine Lady Jessica, and the grandfather of Leto Atreides II, who would later go on to become the God Emperor of Doom. Celebrated for his fair and compassionate leadership, he managed the reins of Caladan before shifting to the harsh desert world of Arrakis. This was all amidst an ongoing feud with the devious Baron Harkonnen. House Atreides were essentially one of the big players in the galactic Padisher Empire, and one of the so-called Houses Major. The family claimed their lineage all the way back to Old Earth, specifically to ancient Greece as descendants of King Agamemnon, a son of Atreus, hence the Atreides tag. For 20 generations, Atreides ran the show on Caladan, making it a model of good governance. They had a knack for creating a society that was not only well organized, but also spiritually content. Caladan was a verdant paradise, quite the opposite of the Harkonnen's industrial hellscape, Gaida Prime. But you shouldn't be fooled by their utopian lifestyle. The Atreides were also battle-hardened, with sword masters, war masters, mentats, and their own unique battle language. Leto's childhood was anything but ordinary. His dad, Paulus Atreides, had some unconventional ideas about education, much to the chagrin of Leto's mother, Helena. Instead of the usual noble upbringing, Paulus had Leto mingling with villagers and common folk. At 14, Leto was shipped off to Ix for a formal education. It was here that he befriended Rumber and Kylia Vernius during their high-tech training sessions, tours of cutting-edge facilities, and deep dives into business philosophy. Every third morning, Leto and his friends would sweat it out on an automated training floor under the watchful eye of Master Zaz. Think of it as a futuristic gym class with extra lasers. His keen eye soon noticed the growing unrest among the Ixian suboids, the working class at the bottom of the social ladder. Folks that were none too happy about Ix's risky tech experiments, flirting dangerously close to the forbidden realm of thinking machines. For a deeper understanding of their trepidation, watch my video on the Butler and Jihad, which covered the thinking machines. When the Tleilaxu invaded Ix, sparking Project Amal, the suboids rebelled, forcing Leto, along with Kylie and Rombo, to narrowly escape with their lives during the chaotic revolution. Unfortunately, just like his own son, his path to dukedom was sudden and tragic, with his father meeting a dramatic end at the horns of a Seleucid bull during a bullfighting event. Despite this, as a young duke, he was known for his straight talk and unwavering honesty. Early in his reign, he boldly defended House Vernius in front of the Landsraad, gaining the respect of many nobles, but trouble was brewing. On his way back from Kaitain, Leto's ship was caught in a Harkonnen ambush. Using a no-ship, the Harkonnens framed Leto for destroying a Tleilaxu vessel, and Leto, standing firm in his innocence, demanded a trial by forfeiture to clear his name. In a dramatic turn of events at Kaitain, Leto faced the entire Landsraad in potential ruin. But here, Crown Prince Shaddam Carino IV, armed with a forged note implicating Leto and Project Amal, chose to uphold Leto's reputation. Presenting him with the Emperor's Blade, Shaddam swayed the Landsraad to declare Leto innocent, much to the dismay of the Tleilaxu and Harkonnens. Leto's first act as a new duke was straight out of an opera, avenging his father's death at the horns of the fearsome bull, El Muerte. Armed with his father's sword, he entered the arena, not just to face a bull, but to win the hearts and trust of the Caladan people, ultimately doing just that. However, soon after, he faced a mutiny on Pinskow. His own troops had taken their officers hostage, but Leto wasn't just any duke. 
He dug deep to find the root of their grievances and resolved them, turning a mutiny into an opportunity to solidify his troops' loyalty. It was his integrity and personality that facilitated this, not just his title. Emperor Shaddam IV, a big fan of bullfighting, took a keen interest in Leto post-mutiny. They had a private audience where, amusingly, they only chatted about El Muerte's defeat, and the meeting went on for so long that it threw off the Emperor's schedule. From 10,158 to 10,174 HE, Leto became known as one of the most honorable nobles around. When House Harkonnen raided House Tipnir, Leto didn't just sit back. He led a black raid on Guided Prime, liberating 20,000 slaves and wrecking the Harkonnen slave fleet. This daring feat brought Gurney Halleck into the fold of House Atreides. His next big win was at the Battle of Thar System in 10,167 AG. For his bravery, Emperor Shaddam IV honored him with the title Chevalier of the Imperium. This wasn't just a medal, it was a sign of the Emperor's growing respect for Leto. A person needs new experiences. It jars something deep inside, allowing them to grow. Without change, something sleeps inside us and seldom awakens. The sleeper must awaken. It's safe to say the Duke had a knack for winning hearts, especially among his troops and commanders. Under his rule, House Atreides' forces became known as the most loyal, trustworthy, and honorable military this side of the Imperium. A military force that was more like a band of brothers than hide guns. He also had a soft spot for orphans, turning Castle Caladan into something of a cross between a noble house and an orphanage. He'd scoop up promising young ones, raise them like his own, and then apprentice them. His love life was, let's just say, unconventional. He'd hire concubines, then sell their contracts back to them for a penny, effectively liberating them from bondage. Despite his virtues, his style rubbed some the wrong way. His fairness and refusal to marry for political reasons were seen as subtle jabs at less honorable nobles who thought a good marriage is about alliances and not affection. It's also important to consider that the Emperor's public thumbs up to Leto's noble behavior was both a blessing and a curse. It was like being the teacher's pet in the most cutthroat school in the galaxy. This envy, ironically, set the stage for Leto's downfall. Imagine being so good that it becomes your biggest problem. The court also viewed Leto as an upstart from a backwater planet known for Pundi rice, not exactly a culinary delight. Thus, his rise to fame was seen as an affront to the established order, a challenge to those who preferred the status quo. Duke Leto was a bit of a romantic rebel. Not only did he refuse to marry for political gain, but his love life was more like a carousel. But in 10,175 AG, things took a turn. Leto's buyers, probably sweating bullets, brought him Jessica, a gift from the headmistress of the Bene Gesserit school on Caladan. Vetted by Thufa Huat, the Duke's mentat, she was a cut above the rest. And Leto didn't waste any time. He brought Jessica to dinner on his arm, a first for any concubine, and included her in the table talk. Fast forward five months and Jessica was expecting a child that would be named Paul, changing Leto's life and that of the universe forever. He swapped pacing the castle for parenting, pouring his efforts into making Paul a worthy Atreides. Your grandfather said, a great man doesn't seek to lead. He's called to it, and he answers, I found my own way to it. Maybe you'll find yours. With the help of Warmaster Halleck and Swordmaster, later Warmaster Duncan Idaho, Leto started training Paul in command as soon as the boy could talk. Unfortunately, the Emperor's fondness for Leto didn't sit well with the other nobles, and they tried to undermine him at court. In the Battle of Grunmin in 10,176 AG, Atreides' forces shone brightly, but this success was a double-edged sword. It made the Emperor and his advisors nervous, as a duke with unwavering loyalty from his troops was a potential threat to the throne, regardless of his intention. I have all that an honest man could want, the love of a woman, the loyalty of my subjects, the respect of my peers and his son. Duke Leto Atreides I was not your average interstellar nobleman. His political savvy and charisma won him a fan club across the Imperium. But with great popularity comes great envy, especially from Emperor Shaddam Carino IV. The Atreides' voice is rising. The Emperor is a jealous man, a dangerous, jealous man. The Emperor continued to see Leto as a threat, so he hatched a plan using the age-old feud between Houses Atreides and Harkonnen. The idea, to get rid of Duke Leto and House Atreides for good. After nearly two decades on Caladan with Lady Jessica, the Emperor gave Leto an offer he couldn't refuse, to take over Arrakis from House Harkonnen. We are House Atreides, 
There is no call we do not answer. There is no faith that we betray. Arrakis, a.k.a. Dune, was like the Wild West of space, but with the added bonus of being the only source of the universe's most coveted spice, Melange. It was a high-risk, high-reward situation, yet sensing both opportunity and danger, he jumped at the chance. Upon arriving on Arrakis, Leto made his intentions clear. He planted a flag on the battlements of Arrakeen and declared, Here I am, here I remain, a line that would prove to be prophetic. The Empress sent Leto a letter, oozing with full support, promising full backing from House Carino, but behind the scenes, he was sharpening the knife for Leto's back. Despite all of this, Leto quickly made a positive impression on the people of Dune. His fair-minded leadership and charm won over everyone, from the Fremen to the aristocracy, but just as he was getting cozy, the Emperor played his hand. Worried about Leto's growing power and his elite fighting force that could rival the Sardauka, he gave Baron Harkonnen and the green light to invade and wipe out House Atreides. And as a bonus, he even lent some of his own Sardauka to the cause. In the world of Dune, trust is as scarce as water on Arrakis, something the Duke was forced to learn the hard way during the Harkonnen invasion. His trusted Sook doctor, Wellington Yo, turned his coat and handed Leto over to the Harkonnens on a silver platter. Feeling a tad guilty and angered that Harkonnen kidnapped his wife, he left Leto with a parting gift, a poison tooth. The plan, for him to bite down, release the poison, and take Baron Harkonnen out. It was the kind of idea that sounded great on paper. In true dramatic fashion, Leto's last-ditch effort to take the Baron down didn't go quite as planned. He bit down, the poison did its thing, and while it took out a few of his people, including Peter de Vries, the twisted Mentat, the Baron lived to scheme another day. Fast forward a few years, and Paul recovered his father's remains and laid them to rest in the skull tomb in the deserts of Arrakis, a fitting resting place for a duke that had braved the sands of politics and betrayal. But Leto's legacy didn't end with his dramatic exit. His influence lived on in Paul's reign as the Emperor. And then there was Alia, Leto's daughter, carried by Jessica and only discovered after his death. My father came, not for spice, not for the riches, but for the strength of your people. My road leads into the desert. If you'll have us, we will come. His story was cut short, but his impact echoed throughout the generations, shaping the destiny of Arrakis and the Imperium. Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens when we're awake. Even after his demise, Duke Leto Atreides I wasn't just a footnote in the history of Dune. His essence lingered in the form of other memory within his son Paul and grandson Leto II. In fact, Leto's fondness for Duncan Idaho also deeply influenced Leto II, who kept bringing back Idaho in the form of Gaulers. During the reigns of Paul and Leto II, his shrine turned into a hotspot. Millions flocked to pay homage, drawn by the religious mystique that now surrounded the Atreides' name. It's like Leto became the patron saint of integrity and bravery. More than just a beloved figure, Leto embodied the best of the Atreides' bloodline. Courage, integrity, loyalty, justice, honesty, and honor. He was the poster boy for noble virtues, a standard against which future Atreides were measured. Some have mused that if Leto had not met his untimely end, he might have commanded the same fanatical devotion from the Fremen that Paul did. It's important to note that Leto's popularity wasn't limited to the sands of Arrakis. He had fans in high places of the lands around too. This has led to speculation that he might have been a contender for the Golden Lion Throne, which would explain why the Emperor was so eager to end him. The story of Duke Leto Atreides I is tinged with tragedy, not just because of his death, but because of what could have been. His character, his talents, the love of his people, all point to a path untraveled, a potential unfulfilled. It's the classic tale of what if that adds a poignant depth to the saga of Dune. Much more remains of my father than these few fragments. His bloodline, his character, and his teachings have made me who I am. As long as the universe remembers me as Paul Muad'Dib, so too will Duke Leto Atreides be remembered. The son is always shaped by the father. In the end, his story is one of virtue against a backdrop of envy and politics. He was a beacon of integrity in a world where such qualities were as rare as a friendly sandworm on Arrakis. His legacy is a testament to the idea that sometimes, being too good can be a downfall, especially in the treacherous dunes of interstellar politics.
With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Duke Leto Atreides the first. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. You gave me a son, and from the moment he was born, I trusted you completely. Now I'm asking you this one thing. If anything happens, will you protect our son? Neto, this is not you. I thought we'd have more time. Paul Atreides. You are your father's son. You are my son. You are the Duke. Paul Atreides. And if your answer is no, you'll still be the only thing I ever needed you to be. My son.